Dr. Pamela Munster is a professor of medicine at the Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of California, San Francisco. She is the leader of the Experimental Therapeutics Program, director of Early Phase Clinical Trials Unit, and co-director of the UCSF Center for BRCA Research. In Dr. Munster's lab, UCSF scientists are exploring new ways to detect, surveil, intercept, and cure BRCA-related cancers. In addition to her laboratory research, she develops novel strategies to treat patients with incurable cancers as an oncologist. Dr. Munster was diagnosed with BRCA2 mutation in 2012. By transcending the doctor-patient perspective, Dr. Munster gives a framework for successful treatment, epitomizing the personal, patient-centered care that is a hallmark of the UCSF Medical Center. Dr. Munster recently authored Twisting Fate, about her experience as an oncologist and a cancer patient. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Pamela Munster. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, even though it's uh, only virtual. It's my pleasure to talk about uh, recent advances in adjuvant therapy for breast cancer. And I have to say, uh, as I put this presentation together, a lot has happened over the last uh, two or three years. And I like to give this presentation from the perspective of a patient who sees a doctor. So many of my slides are labeled questions for the doctor. So briefly about nomenclature, I'm not expecting you to remember all of this, but adjuvant therapy means after completion of surgery or radiation therapy, neoadjuvant therapy means before surgery, either neoadjuvant chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Extended adjuvant therapy means after five years of hormonal therapy. And post neoadjuvant means if you had chemotherapy or immunotherapy before surgery, and then a patient had surgery, and there's still a lot of tumor left we would call this the post-neoadjuvant therapy. Here is briefly what I'm gonna cover, and there's actually quite uh, many uh, treatment options I'm gonna dis uh, discuss. And a lot of it is just help you guide how, how to talk to the doctor, what to look for, um, and, and what the different options are. So in general, principles of treatment and workup for early stage breast cancer, adjuvant chemotherapy options, adjuvant hormonotherapy option, adjuvant and neoadjuvant immunotherapy, and genetic testing and post-neoadjuvant therapy. So let's get started with my first case. Mary is a 65 year old, otherwise healthy and fit woman who is found to have a 2.1 centimeter tumor on routine mammogram in the outer upper quadrant of her right breast. She entered menopause at age 54. She has no other medical concerns and no family history of cancer. So what are the next steps and important workups? So what's important for us for treatment planning? When Mary presents to the oncologist in order for treatment planning. What we need to know is the size of the tumor, the number of lymph nodes involved, which is the stage. We need to know what the hormone on her two receptors are, which is the subtype. And then we talk a little bit about tumor grades and, and other subtypes, but stage and subtypes are the most important question for treatment planning. So if you look at uh, the distribution of, of breast cancer, who gets breast cancer, the, the big peak of breast cancer is actually between 60 and 69. Breast cancer starts under 40. There's many women under 40 who present with breast cancer, but it gradually increases uh, with peaking between 60 and, uh, to 69. But we still see a fair number of new breast cancer cases, even in someone over 80. So it's a broad distribution over a woman's life. Um, breast cancer is mainly and 
a little bit more common seen in Caucasian women, white women. Second most common is, is in, in African or black women and a little bit less common in Hispanics and, and less common than in Asians. What's important to know is that there is still a difference in incidence, which how many, is means how many cancers we see and mortality, which is how many women die from their disease. And what you see here, NHW means non-Hispanic whites. They have the most number of cases for breast cancer. The mortality is fairly low, no meaning that we detect many cancers earlier where the mortality is quite a bit higher in, in non-Hispanic black women. So a lot of effort in, in our treatment is geared towards better diagnostic, better access to care, better treatment for black women. If you look at the distribution of uh, breast cancer stages, most of the breast cancers that are stage one, meaning less than two centimeters, are actually quite uh, indolent, means not very aggressive or intermediate. They tend to be often very well behaved. And, and often we say if someone is diagnosed with a less than two centimeter tumor, which is stage one, after the age of 70, the likelihood that this woman dies from breast cancer is actually quite low. So, but most important, if you go back and look at uh, Mary's case, um, there's a 71% chance that she is hormone receptor positive, meaning estrogen and progesterone receptor positive and HER2 negative. The triple negative, the pure triple negative is only 12%. So this is a, and it depends a little bit on the, on the age, but triple negative breast cancer is quite a bit more rare than a truly HER2 negative estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive patient. So now what we found is like Mary's tumor is 1.9 centimeter, makes her stage one. She has no lymph nodes involved. Uh, she had a central lymph node biopsy that showed uh, no lymph node involved. Her lumpectomy was excising the tumor with clear margin. She was a uh, hormone uh, receptor positive. ER positive, PR positive, and HER2 negative. Um, so the next step is like, does Mary need chemotherapy? And there's an important step at this point is like, your surgeon or the medical oncologist would need to order any of the genomic testings. And genomic testing can be Oncotype DX, Mama Print, PAM50, or others. In the, this area in the United States, in general, Oncotype DX and Mama Print are probably the two tests that are um, ordered most frequently. And you don't need several of those, you just need one. So why is this relevant? What Oncotype DX does, this is one of the tests, it tests in addition to estrogen and progesterone and HER2, PGR stands for progesterone, it tests 21 genes that are also relevant when it comes to um, uh, prognosis and response to therapy in breast cancer. And of those five are reference genes, these are just like giving our control, making sure the test is, uh, is uh, appropriate. And then we have 16 genes that are actually telling us what's the risk and what's the potential benefit for such an individual, such an individual receive from chemotherapy. Oncotype DX results come back as, a, if you look here to the left as a number 18, that would be the recurrent score that translated to a 5% risk of having a recurrence in 10 years. So it means like if you took this patient and you gave this patient's hormonal therapy with, um, with either tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor, and I get to that in, in a little bit, the, the risk of a recurrence over 10 years, tumor coming back in the breast or spreading elsewhere is 5%. 
the benefits from chemotherapy for this scenario be less than 1%. So the recommendation for Mary would not be to give her chemotherapy. So large trials have actually looked at uh, this, and this is uh, the data from two very large trial, Taylor X and MINDAC trial, looking at uh, what would happen, what would be the benefits of, of treating someone with a recurrent score of 18 um, or less than 20 less greater 25, 11 to 25, or 0 to 10. And because there was a lot of uncertainty in this subgroup of the, of, of the 11 to 25, the initial data suggests that the intermediate group, like a, a recurrent score of 18, would benefit from chemotherapy. However, we studied this more closely in a 10,000 patient trial. And as you see in the next slide, if you look here, these are like this slide shows the invasive disease free survival, uh, which is our primary endpoint, and the secondary endpoint is distance, relapse free survival. Like on the left is any tumor coming back, including tumor coming back in the breast, and the secondary endpoint is just looking at having metastasis. And as you can see here, it's actually hard to see, but there is a blue and a yellow line. And you see there is no difference between the blue and the yellow line, meaning like whether the patient has or not, or doesn't have chemotherapy made no difference. So clearly if someone with a recurrent score between 11 and 25, um, such as Mary had, uh, would not benefit from chemotherapy. So this confirmed the initial recommendation of the intermediate group for on Oncotype DX that there's no benefit from chemotherapy. So our patient has, an, uh, has a stage one cancer, it's ER, PR positive or two negative, um, and has a re recurrent score of 18, so no chemotherapy is recommended. So what hormonal therapy should Mary uh, consider? There is actually multiple choices. There's tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen um, by blocking the estrogen receptor. And then there are aromatase inhibitors. Aromatase inhibitors act by withdrawing estrogen, removing circulating precursor estrogen and reducing the production of estrogen. So the, these are two options. There have been several studies looking at tamoxifen versus aromatase inhibitor for five years. Tamoxifen and then aromatase inhibitors, starting with aromatase inhibitor and then tamoxifen, tamoxifen versus there's multiple, multiple studies. Um, five years of tamoxifen followed by five years of an aromatase inhibitor and placebo. Um, so when you, as a patient, see an oncologist, these are all the options that some doctors may recommend you. So in, in, in general, what we recommend, um, if you're a postmenopausal woman, we typically start with aromatase inhibitor for five years. If the patient can't tolerate it, we may give tamoxifen for two to three years, followed by an aromatase inhibitor. And then we consider five more years of a hormonal therapy after that. And as you see here, there's multiple, multiple options. So I, as uh, someone sees a doctor, they often come away with like choices. And I know from being a practicing oncologist, sometimes choices are difficult for the patients as they are difficult for the doctors. So there's, there's not often a right or wrong. In general, the aromatase inhibitors are a little bit better. They are not impacting overall survival. If someone cannot tolerate the aromatase inhibitor because of a specific side effect profile, tamoxifen is an absolutely an, uh, acceptable choice. Um, there are three aromatase inhibitors, as I, um, there is a bit of a delay. As you see here, there are three aromatase inhibitors, letrozole and astrozole and exemestane. And Quite frankly, there is no distinguishing features between one of them. So if your doctor feels very strongly about an astrosol and another doctor feels more strongly about retrosol, retrosol, there is actually no clarity on that any of these drugs are better. They have, they have been compared head to head without much difference.
Okay, so in summary for Mary, she had a right, she presented with a tumor on a mammogram, 1.9 centimeters. Her surgery uh, was a right lumpectomy. She had the central lymph node biopsy. She then was found to have a stage one tumor, which which means like a small tumor, no lymph node. She's ERPR positive. We obtained the uh, oncotype DX, and she's even recommended to have five years of an aromatase inhibitor as I said, tamoxifen is acceptable. And then an extended hormonal therapy at 10 years in higher risk women, which Mary is not. So if Mary were in my practice, we would have a discussion whether she really should continue beyond five years. Many women who have no side effects feel a little bit more protected by going longer, but stopping at five is totally acceptable. Um, not to mention uh, Mary should have radiation therapy between the lumpectomy and starting the hormonal therapy. Okay, next, next case. Kate is a 35 year old, uh, otherwise healthy and fit a woman who presents with a rapidly enlarging mass of the right breast. She has normal skin and no dimpling around the breast. A biopsy. And it's important to know that any young woman with anything that grows in the breast should always have a biopsy. There is no such thing as being too young to have breast cancer. So don't ever let anyone say there is no need for a biopsy in a young woman. That should, that should be really double checked. Imaging, and she had an MRI and a, and a mammogram suggests that she's a greater than five centimeter tumor in the breast and an enlarged lymph node in the right axilla. Now, Five centimeter means two inches. In, uh, in the oncology practice, we always talk about a metric measurement. So if you're uncertain how this is measured, uh, five cent, two inches, greater than two inches, uh, puts someone from a stage two disease to stage three disease. She has no other medical concerns. She has no children um, and no family history of breast cancer. So next step, chemotherapy or surgery. Should we do surgery on, the, on this patient first or should we do chemotherapy first? Here is what we as oncologists are, are really um, anxious to accomplish. If we give chemotherapy before surgery, that gives us two uh, approaches. It will tell us what's the likelihood of that our chemotherapy or, or therapy is working. And it also gives us a better idea what the outcomes is. In 2014, the FDA established pathological complete response as a surrogate for approval for new drugs because it tells us as an idea what how how do drugs work. So what does a pathologic complete response mean? And typically we call this a PASCR or PCR. If you see the word PCR or PASCR listed, that stands for pathological complete response. And that means upon surgery, there is no tumor found, not in the lymph nodes and not in the in the breast. That's a PASCR. And what you see here in pink in both of those uh, graphs, the women who had a PASCR have actually much better outcomes. So it's important to have a complete eradication of uh, your tumor by, by a therapy. So if you look here, there's a little bit of a, of a further distinction of the PASCR. If you look at uh, triple negative disease, which is TNBC or HER2 positive disease, both flanking the graphs. If you look at the, the gray and uh, dark red curves, you really see that if the tumor doesn't respond to therapy, patients don't have an, a good outcome if, uh, if they don't have more therapy. And the percent freezer, the relapse free survival means like how many of these women have no tumor recurrence over the course of eight years. And if you look at the triple negative disease uh, group, you see that red line is about only about 30% will not have progressed at three years. And what you further see in, in triple negative breast cancer, um, if even if someone had a very bad disease, 
uh, at three years, uh, it starts to flatten out. So the triple negative breast cancer tends to come back sooner. The same is true for her two positive disease. If you have a smaller tumor, like the blue line or the yellow line, it doesn't seem to matter as much whether you have a, in a complete eradication of, of your, of your uh, tumor. And that has to do with the fact that smaller tumors tend not to spread anyway. So if someone has a stage one disease, it's not probably not as relevant whether they have chemo first or surgery first, but in larger tumors, I think having therapy first is really important. So an important step for Kate who is 35 and has not had any children is she should immediately be referred to fertility clinic. Often we can, within a very short period of time, we can actually um, get uh, her eggs harvested and then save her fertility and then start chemotherapy. We should also have BRCA and other hereditary gene testing because it's important to have uh, an idea of what your underlying risk is uh, for later surgical therapy. So now the next question is in 2021, um, does the patient get immunotherapy, chemotherapy or both? And I think with, which is really a, the new approach to triple negative breast cancer starting of this year is that we have introduced immunotherapy to chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer. And this comes from the fact that we had several studies looking at uh, um, past CR and again, pathological complete response rate. And what you see is um, if you have a combination with immunotherapy versus no immunotherapy and everyone has chemo, the past CR for all the immunotherapies is quite a bit bigger than when the chemotherapy alone are. So suggesting that we have better eradications of tumors, of course, the eradication of tumors at time of surgery does not necessarily predict outcomes. So in order for the FDA to approve an immune checkpoint inhibitor for uh, early stage triple negative breast cancer, the sponsors also had to prove that patients actually had better outcomes. So this is the study. This is a the large a keynote 522, which led to the approval of pembrolizumab for triple negative early stage breast cancer. And what this study was is like patients with, uh, with tumors that were at least uh, a stage two or lymph node involvement with a good performance status were either randomized to getting um, standard of care chemotherapy and then they got either pembrolizumab here in green uh, or placebo in dark purple for 24 weeks, which is six months. They then had surgery and then they were continued on having pembrolizumab or placebo in the adjuvant phase. And this is what I meant with the, there's a neoadjuvant phase before surgery and there's an adjuvant phase after surgery. And then the question was, who has not just a higher response rate? Uh, I already shown you the immunotherapy arm has a higher response rate in terms of PASCR, but also who has less chance of the tumor coming back or becoming metastatic. This study looked at uh, 1174 patients, pretty large study. And the question, as I said, was looking at PEMBRA plus chemo versus placebo plus chemo either before surgery or after surgery. And if you look at the past CR, clearly the, the pembrolizumab arm had a higher percentage of past CR, but it also had a higher percentage of end-free survival, meaning like how many uh, of uh, those patients did not have a tumor recurrence either in the breast or, or elsewhere in the body. And you see like in the pembrolizumab arm, 91.3% were event free at three years and 85%, so this is different about 6%. So adding pembrolizumab prevented about 6% of patients to have, um, not have a breast cancer that's metastatic. Uh, when it comes to grade three or other adverse events and grade three events are typically very significant events with compromised uh, 
on quality of life and of the long time is about a 5% difference. So it's very important for us as the oncologists to recognize, yes, immunotherapy really improves outcomes. However, the grade three and often lasting, uh, lasting adverse side effects can cause, it can cause long-term diabetes, can cause long-term thyroid problems, immune-related uh, colitis, inflammation of the bowels and others. So uh, immunotherapy should not be given lightly and there has to be a clear benefit. So a person with a very small tumor should not have immunotherapy, should not be considered for immunotherapy. Anyone is a high risk to have an immune-related event because they have underlying autoimmune diseases. We have to be very careful whether we want to give immunotherapy. So this is actually the, the graph, and as you see here, uh, like typical triple negative disease, there's a recurrence rate at the beginning. And you see here, after about 18 months, that the recurrence uh, start to even out. It's like while everyone feels very shocked and, 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 and very frightened when, when they first present with triple negative breast cancer, but if someone with triple negative breast cancer hasn't had a tumor recurrence or spreading after the first two years, they're pretty much home free. So there is, early on it's, it's difficult to have a triple negative breast cancer because it's more scary at three to four years, um, there's a much better outlook. So I'm always very happy when triple negative patients have reached their three year mark. Okay, um, interestingly, for those who are really in the, in the know and in the weeds, PDL1 expression, which is a big marker, this is protest ligand 1 expression, it's a big marker for immunotherapy response in, in many diseases, does not seem to matter in triple negative breast cancer for PEMPRA response. Interestingly, um, the majority of triple negative breast cancer actually have PDL1 expression. PDL1 expression positive means more than 1% of cells have it. Um, so, suggesting that patients uh, with triple negative breast cancer, early triple negative breast cancer, do very well with the, with the immune checkpoint inhibitor and higher PDL1 expression means better outcome anyway. And you see this here the, the response rate, even to standard of care chemotherapy in those with high expression of PDL1 is much better than those with low PDL1 expression. So, in summary, PDL1 expression is a good thing because it predicts good response to chemo and even better response to immune checkpoint inhibitor, but both benefit. So, now this patient, Kate, has a has her oocyte harvest completed. She's BRCA1 positive. She has uh, begun immunotherapy and chemotherapy. So the next question is, um, do we add carboplatin? Um, big question for again, for those in the know and in the weeds, do carboplatins really add? Uh, and do we give a PARP inhibitor after neoadjuvant therapy? So these are the questions that you may have as you present um, yes. So a lot of question is about and BRCA mutation and HRD and PARP inhibitors in early stage breast cancer. We know that uh, patients with BRCA mutation tend to be a bit more sensitive to chemotherapy. And HR deficiency means like uh, BRCA, either BRCA mutated or having another mutation. Uh, and as you see here, like the PDL1 expression, Having a BRCA mutation when it comes to triple negative breast cancer response to chemotherapy, the response is actually quite a bit more, so a higher response rate to those with BRCA mutation to standard chemotherapy, even if you have no carboplatin. And carboplatin seemed to work well for patients with BRCA mutations. However, when it came to a very large study, there's some benefit from adding carboplatin uh, to to uh, improve overall survival or relapse on disease-free survival, but that has not really clearly pinned out. So uh, most of the oncologists will actually not add carboplatin to the mix. And, and unless you're BRCA-positive uh, patients, uh, probably don't really benefit or need carboplatin. 
So what about the PARP inhibitors? The, this patient is BRCA1 germline positive, and that's been a, a very important advance in the, in the last uh, couple of years. So a BRCA mutation means like it's a gene mutation that involves uh, DNA repair, so how tumors can repair itself in a given chemotherapy. And as you can see, if someone has a BRCA mutation, they can actually not repair the damage that chemotherapy induces. And from a, from a treatment perspective, this is actually really a good thing. There are about three and now probably closer to 6,000 different uh, BRCA mutations known in, in the world that, that cause problems. Um, typically, the BRCA mutation occurs in one of the two chromosomes, every chromosome, and humans have 23 pairs of those. Each pair has, has two what we call alleles, and one of the alleles here is, is mutant. So this also means that of these mutations, you can pass one on to 50% of your, of your offspring. So if if a woman or man has a BRCA mutation and they, their children will have a 50-50 chance of inheriting this mutation. So why is this relevant? Um, if you look at the lifetime risk of breast cancer, if someone has a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, their lifetime risk to having breast cancer at any time over their life is almost 80%, which is actually quite high. So in terms of surgical planning, this is really an important consideration. If you have a PALB2 mutation, which is less well known, but stands for partner and localizer of BRCA2, not surprising, it's very similar to, to BRCA2, that, that risk for breast cancer is also quite high. So these, these three mutations comprise a very high risk for BRCA mutation. And then there's ATM and check mutation, which have a lifetime risk of 20 to 40%. So here we probably would offer uh, prophylactic mastectomies. Here we probably do more intense screening. And if you look at the risk of uh, breast cancer, genetic mutation is the highest risk of any types of risk other than ductal carcinoma and breast radiation. Um, that's hopefully no longer going to be done. Um, every other risk factor is way longer. And all the risk factors that uh, you've been told about early menarche, meaning the first time you got your periods or late menopause and, and, and all of this, alcohol and uh, so none of this matches up in any way than having a genetic mutation. So I think in my estimation, everyone should be tested for genetic mutations, particularly back I wanted to, and I'm going to skip this for time. Um, and I just wanted to bring this, if you see here, um, the incidence of uh, breast cancer from BRCA1 and BRCA2, it's really continuous over, over life. There's, there's often this thought that if you had a BRCA mutation, you get breast cancer early in life, but it actually doesn't go away. So it's many of the women are actually diagnosed even at the higher age. So anyone with a BRCA mutation should be very closely screened um, for breast cancer all throughout their life. And the same is true for ovarian cancer. And I think what we can somewhat reassuringly say BRCA1 carriers have a high risk of ovarian cancer, but it doesn't start until 40, and for BRCA2, it doesn't start until 50, so we can leave people's uh, ovaries a little bit longer. So what about PARP inhibitors? PARP inhibitors are an oral form of agents that are specifically targeted to work for those with a, with a BRCA mutation. Again, because tumors that have a mutated uh, BRCA, they cannot repair itself, so if if chemotherapy or a specific form of therapy um, happens in a tumor, the tumor tries to repair the damage and survive. BRCA mutated tumors can't really survive and the Olaparib removes the ability to repair itself and survive. So what the patients have uh, been exposed to is like after chemotherapy or immunotherapy, um, Patients were then offered to either being for one year on Olaparib, which is the PARP inhibitor of, uh, record here, versus placebo. The majority of patients enrolled in the trial were, sorry, there's a, where did they all end up here? Just 
Sorry guys, I'm thinking I'm having a duplication of my slides here. I seem to not be able to um, get to my slides. Let's see. Bear with me. Ah, here we are. Thank you. Sorry about that. So what you see here is if you're looking at in invasive disease-free inter uh, survival, that means how many women will have uh, no tumor by 43 months. And what you can see here, those who got no lap rib, there's a much higher chance of freedom from invasive disease, meaning tumor coming back either in the breast or elsewhere. And that, that difference carries on through time. So as you can see here, there's, there's a pretty substantial difference in the number of women who will not have a recurrence. So for, for Kate, she should have immunotherapy and chemotherapy. Carboplatin may be indicated, but typically not something that we generally recommend. She should have a comprehensive surgical approach due to the BRCA mutation. She should consider a PARP inhibitor. So next case, Anne is a 51 year old, otherwise healthy and fit woman. She presents with a lump in the right axilla, that means in her armpit. Mammogram shows a three centimeter lesion. Biopsy of the axillary mass shows a HER2 positive ER and PR negative tumor. She's been postmenopausal since age 49 and she has no other medical concerns. She has, as I said, uh, she has an HER2 positive ER negative tumors that happens in about 5%. Uh, HER2 positive, ER positive tumors happen in about 12%, but we treat them all the same. What HER2 does, it's, an, it's a, a protein that's expressed on the top of the cells and has in the past been considered a really super aggressive tumor. Um, so what we measure is we, we either stain this by protein, we measure these, by, these HER2 expressions by protein, which is IHC, or we look at the uh, FISH testing, fluorescent in situ hybridization or ISH testing, where we actually measure the HER2 gene. And then the question is, we want to probably give, uh, after we have est established that this truly HER2 positive by FISH, we want to test for, for cardiac function. And then we, we probably in the size of uh, the size of her tumor, we probably want to give her new adjuvant chemotherapy. And then the question really for, for the doctor and the patients, is there a single right choice for her, her two positive early stage breast cancer? And as you can imagine, the way I asked the question, there isn't. If you look at the NCN, NCCN guideline, uh, this is our guidelines, what is acceptable therapy, you see there's a preferred regimen and then there are really five other regimens. Um, if you have a HER2 positive breast cancer, you see a physician and you see a second opinion and you get two different opinion, that doesn't mean that one of them is wrong. The, the key is to actually at least get one uh, biologic receptin and another biologic progenitor. It is also called trastuzumab and per pertuzumab. They both attack the HER2 protein by a different means. Um, we would like to get two chemotypes and two biologic agents. That should be the preferred approach for any tumor that's more than two centimeters. So moving on to the, my last case, and that is a case uh, that's a little bit more complicated. I talked to you about uh, my, my first patient was a 65-year-old uh, woman with an ER-positive breast cancer. Um, this is also, Susan is a 41-year-old, but she's premenopausal. She has a tumor that's a bit bigger, and she has a lymph node that's enlarged and that's positive. And that tumor is ER positive and PR positive, estrogen and progesterone receptor positive. Her two negative, she has no med other medical concerns, but she's premenopausal. And why is this important? 
Does she need an oncotype? Her tumor is actually even bigger than what we found in the, in the mammogram. So the, in the young women, mammograms are often not as good. Uh, the tumor grade was grade three and she has four lymph nodes involved. Um, she's ER positive, PR positive, but HUT2 negative. Her oncotype was 19 and I may actually tell you that she probably wouldn't have needed an oncotype in the first place. But remember, as I walked you through the oncotype testing and the recurrence score and the, that's between 12 and 25 and the data suggests that uh, such an individual actually doesn't need chemotherapy. But I think more recent data puts a premenopausal high risk breast cancer in a bit of a different category. So the trial is called the Responder X. And what they actually looked at is like, they looked at women with a recurrence score between zero and 25 and randomized them therapy, therapy meaning hormonal therapy um, or endocrine therapy alone. And again, the uh, Taylor X trial had 10,000 women looked at, do women really need to have chemotherapy when they have an intermediate recurrence score? And the answer was no. What responders did, they looked at a little bit of a higher risk group of people. They only looked at patients who had lymph node involvement. Um, and they looked at, they had particular interest in looking at more younger women. So what we found is like, like Taylor X, if a patient is postmenopausal, an intermediate recurrence score, there is no benefit from chemotherapy. But if you look at premenopausal women here, and so in someone who is like a, like this patient who has a five centimeter tumor, which puts in a stage three category, we probably really would like to give this patient chemotherapy because there is a benefit on, on chemotherapy for this patient. Um, so what this means is premenopausal with larger, no positive, ER positive tumors should probably consider chemotherapy be regardless of oncotype. If, if you as a patient are younger premenopausal and while a year and a half ago or two years ago, everyone got an oncotype and your doctor says you don't need it because you should have Cuba anyway, that's the reason. I would fully agree that you probably don't need an oncotype DX. So what are we doing for hormonal therapy for high risk ER positive uh, breast cancer in someone who's uh, premenopausal? And so the studies that were looked at were calling text or soft adjuvant, ovarian suppression, plus tamoxifen or examistin versus tamoxifen alone in hormone positive early stage breast cancer. And what they did is they looked at either tamoxifen alone, examistin, examistin, tamoxifen with ovarian suppression. These are like uh, the three things. And as you um, may remember uh, from what I quickly suggested early, tamoxifen is is the only choice for premenopausal women. Aromatase inhibitor can only be given in those who are postmenopausal or made postmenopausal. And made postmenopausal mean either we give a chemical uh, means to suppress ovarian function or we remove the ovaries. So what did soft and text tell us? Um, so often texts tell us that in those patients who have uh, risk, high risk of breast cancer, or ovarian suppression, in addition to either tamoxifen or examistin, is beneficial to tamoxifen alone. So our patient at 41, who is a big tumor, should have ovarian suppression because there's a good chance that the, at 41, despite having six months of chemotherapy, she will regain her... Um, menstruation. And even if someone is going into menopause for a year or two, if her, her menstruation comes back, the uh, aromatase inhibitors will not work. And often we don't know that uh, uh, ovarian suppression is no longer complete. This can change from month to month. Um, and lastly, what about adding a CDK4-6 inhibitor? CDK4-6 inhibitors such as drugs like 
Balbocyclic, ribocyclic, or abemocyclics have been approved and now are the mainstay for ER positive metastatic breast cancer. They are now considered in early stage breast cancer. And who benefits or does she need uh, hormonal uh, therapy with a CDK46 inhibitor? So, what we see here is like a patient being randomized, and those are women with fairly high risk tumors. These are tumors that are either stage three greater than for, for, uh, five centimeters or have a significant amount of uh, lymph node involved, at least four, three, one to three lymph nodes with the other high risk features or a KI67 that is high. And KI67 is a marker for proliferation. And a bemacyclic uh, has been given for up to two years versus just continue with the metrosol or an astrosol or examestinolone. So what this showed is that, and this is this is our disease invasive disease free interval, but this is not going to zero. This is at seventy percent. So that's a lab. A vague, strongly magnified score. So the benefits are are still somewhat in the three to four percent range. So they, while this drug has been approved for the high risk ER positive breast cancer, this approval may still be reconsidered. So I think the last word is not said on this. So I think the this should be considered, but it may uh, this may be revised. So in summary, I think I walked you through four cases, and uh, I think this is hopefully helpful um, to for you to 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 deal with breast cancer. Breast cancer is very overwhelming. Um, should you consider a second opinion? I think it's always reasonable to get a second opinion. Even more reasonable is to think that you cannot have every question answered in the first visit. Please consider making a follow-up visit with the oncologist. If you do get a second opinion, keep in mind whether you stay with your initial doctor, your second opinion. Doctor-patient relationship with the oncologist are often very long-lasting. I find it is very important that you have a good rapport with your doctor. Keep in mind, doctors are humans. They have good and bad days. It's like a um, the doctor who is, was really, really sweet and had a lot of time the first visit and is harried and, and, and sort of like short the next time, both of them are positive. I think uh, it's just, this is a, a relationship like any, any other relationships that they may, you may have to manage this a little bit. But more importantly, it's like many clinical scenarios have multiple options and often they have very really small differences. Um, if two doctors are not completely aligned, ask them what they think about the other and what, why they choose one. And, and it's just really ask them why they choose this. And, and, and often there's actually personal preference or simply because I may think for this patient, this option would be more tolerable. Okay. And as I said, more importantly, one visit may not answer all the questions. The sinus scribe, in, if you go to a doctor, sinus scribe or record a conversation, come back with questions that you haven't understood. Um, there is a very quickly evolving field. And I can tell you from personal experience, having had breast cancer, I couldn't hear anything the plastic surgeon said to me because once he told me that he's going to make a cut in my chest, my mind was gone off somewhere else. So it is very, very difficult to hear everything. So. So please bring someone who just writes all the notes down. That person should be writing the notes, writing the question, and, and you should be focused on, on asking your question and listening. And please, Dr. Google only gets you that far. It just often makes you just very anxious. And from personal experience, it's like, I really struggle when someone comes with 120 pages of uh, Google prints out with the, all the latest advances in, um, in, in medical management of breast cancer when we're just trying to get through the, to get you lined up for the first treatment. So with this, I hope this was helpful and um, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Munster. That was not only informative, but just so um, great to hear you encourage people to ask questions and to participate and get that rapport with their physicians and ask for a second opinion, which um, a lot of people are hesitant to do. So thank you so much. And um, we just have a couple minutes for questions. Um, so I do want to say we won't get to all the questions, but we do encourage you not only to um, continue those conversations with your own physician, but feel free to contact um, BACC and ask about our cancer information and education specialists because they can also help arm you with the information you can then um, take to your doctor to chat about. Um, and you can access them by just calling our helpline. So um, first question was, since about 90% of breast cancer is ductal, what advice do you have for patients with lobular breast cancer to ensure that they get tumor type specific treatments? Sorry. Um, actually, the lobular breast cancer tends to be a little bit more sensitive to hormonal therapy. So we use less chemotherapy. Um, other than that, uh, pretty much we approach them the same way. Lobular carcinoma is a little bit more often bilateral. So if someone has bilateral breast cancer, we, we often worry about because it's be lobular. In terms of treatment, um, the size, the number of lymph nodes tends to trump uh, ductal versus lobular. Hey, thank you. And um, one question is, is it true that late recurrence over five years in remission has been increasing for hormone positive breast cancers? Yes, that's probably, it's not increasing, we, we increasingly see it. So there's not more patients having late recurrences, but we, we see the recurrences often happening later because we treat for five years and patients have significant coverage and that's the reason why we extended the hormonal therapy to 10 years so now we we actually treat uh, patients in numbers we don't see more late recurrences but we, we patients have a longer period until they recur and i think and this is a little bit of the challenge with er positive breast cancer because for triple negative as i said if you don't recur within three or four years there's there's patients are probably fine in ER positive, we don't have that much reassurance. It's rare to have a re recurrence, and particularly for older women, the recurrences are really rare. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this will probably need to be our last question. Um, can you speak to how the text, T-E-X-T slash soft trials pertain to HER2 positive women? It says, I understand HER2 data may, was maybe inconsistent and was actually not included in this data. Yeah, so the, the, most of the patients who are HER2 positive, they, all the focus is on the HER2 targeting. So regardless, so if we don't do Oncotype DX, we don't do uh, any other studies, HER2 positive patients, always we need chemotherapy. As I said, I like to give two chemos and two biologics. Um, when it comes to HER2 positive, ER positive, we then treat them as uh, for their her, ER positive, if someone is premenopausal, probably a, a suppressor of ovarian function. So HER2 first, ER next, but then the ER is going to handle this in mind. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I want to just um, thank you again, Dr. Munster. That was so helpful. And again, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. So do feel free to follow up with your own physician or gather some more information through our services at BACC. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break now and return to our last plenary session with Dr. Spiegel. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you again, doctor. Thank you. Appreciate it.